talking a little bit about speciation, I'll be focusing a lot on genomic architecture. Uh, and the reason for that is if we've all been at this conference for a few days now, it's been a wonderful conference, thank you for that. But there's a lot of talk about methylations, mutations, and genes, but all of those take place within a heterogeneous genomic landscape that can affect all aspects of evolution. And I think that's a really fascinating thing coming from my background, and I hope to convince you by the end of this talk that that's an interesting field of genomic research as well. Now, my other passion that's really developed since I arrived here is falcons, and I hope to convince you that falcons are amazing birds and fantastic birds to study for a variety of reasons. And I think to begin with, it's the complexity, um, the richness of the species within the genus Falco. So what is a falcon? A falcon is a member of the genus Falco. The genus is about 7 million years old, and it has about 40 species. And that's actually a very species-rich, very diverse group of birds. So that's about eight times the average richness of a bird genus, and it's pretty young. And it's even younger than this figure makes it look, because almost all the new species have differentiated within about the last million years, or maybe a couple million years. So you've seen a lot, and there's several major groups that have seen these that divergences. So falcons are a rapidly evolving group, rapidly producing new species uh, now, I mean, in the process, and it makes them excellent candidates to study research on speciation, the continuum, how species diverge, and how they adapt to new environments. Even more so, as the single most broadly distributed bird in the world, which is saying something, is the peregrine falcon. Uh, so this is a bird that's spread across the whole world, probably across the Bering Strait and into North America. Um, but everywhere but, but Antarctica, pretty much, you can find peregrine falcons. <laughs> uh, and they're also the fastest animal that ever lived, right? And so they've adapted to all these habitats. They have a lot of local adaptation. The smallest peregrine is half the size of the largest peregrine, but they're all the same species, but they're all adapting. So they're a great study for local adaptation and the like. And then there's also, part of the reason we're studying falcons here in Abu Dhabi, there's also a very strong cultural importance of falcons as well. So falcons have been used for falconry, which is not exclusively used for falconry. People use hawks and eagles and everything else too in falconry. But falcons have been used in falconry for thousands of years. We don't know exactly when. The oldest evidence we have of falconry is about 4,000, 5,000 years ago, but it could be much older. It predates history. They were symbols and bred by Egyptians. Uh, the very first artifact that we found that was carved by a Neanderthal was actually a falcon bone, so it goes back even then, so this association. So there's this tremendous association between humans and falcons that makes them neglect neglected companion animals. And that actually persists to this day. Uh, there's falcon races. They're every winter in Abu Dhabi. If you're in Abu Dhabi in the winter and you've never been to one, I suggest you go. They're free. They're out by Abu Dhabi airport. But we have falcon races. Uh, it's basically because the hubara are extinct. People wanted something else to continue using falcons and preserve their heritage. So they found out racing them. And so, and there's thousands of falcons bred and imported into the UAE. Uh, so it's kind of a neglected companion animal. How ne how domesticated it is, we don't know, and I can't tell you in this talk, unfortunately, but uh, th there's a lot of research to be done there. It makes some really fascinating birds. But when I got here and started reading about falcons, what really actually fascinated me, and maybe hopefully not just me, is uh, their chromosomal arrangements, right? So if you look at the chromosomal arrangements of different groups of amniotes, you can think of like mammals, for example, all different kind of chromosomal configurations, right? All different kinds of ways that genomic information is broken up across the genome and packaged. Uh, if you look at amphibians, you see the same thing as mammals. And if you look at reptiles, Lepidosauria, most reptiles, you see it's a little more uh, concentrated at the lower end, but it's still fairly variable. If you look at birds, you see a very distinct pattern where more than half, or about half of all birds, have exactly two N of 82, and then there's a little bit of variation around that. And falcons are at the extreme lower outlier. So the only other bird that has as few chromosomes as, as falcons is the cockapoo. It's a flightless uh, parrot. Uh, and I think Madagascar, but I'm not sure. Uh, so falcons have this extreme outlier in the number of chromosomes they had, and they've lost these chromosomes through fusions. So if you compare like a chicken's chromosomal configuration to a falcon's chromosomal configuration, almost all of the chicken chromosomes that are small have fused to a larger chromosome and been lost. Uh, and so that's very peculiar, especially when you look at a, uh, a, a distribution of chromosomes in birds like this, if it's 2N82 conserved, you'd think that's evolutionarily important. So what's happening here? 
And it's also interesting because it ties into a broader question of how genomes are arranged in general. So uh, genomes have sort of high GC content areas and low, and low GC, high AT content areas. And g genomic content can be either stable, uh, constant GC content over time kind of doesn't really change, and it can be changing, right? And in mammals, most of our genes, in birds too, actually, most of the genes are in high GC areas. And in birds, as far as we know until recently, the genomes are stable, the GC content, but mammals are constantly losing it. So we have most of our genes in these high GC areas uh, that we actually think used to be small chromosomes in the ancestor that mammals and birds shared, and that they've lost all these chromosomes. And so mammals are undergoing this shift where we're losing GC content still, hundreds of millions of years later, uh, in these high G, um, hygienic, high GC regions that we think used to be microchromosomes like birds. Uh, but we don't know that. It's just a hypothesis as to why we're seeing these patterns. And one explanation for that is that it was these microchromosomes that got lost and that that threw the whole genome into imbalance. And falcons provide an opportunity for us to test this. Now, there's more important, maybe more directly important than just knowing the past and what happened reasons for this, because we've been hearing a lot about DNA methylation at this conference, right? And that ties into all this. That's the reason genes are in high GC areas, because you need CPG sites. One of the reasons is you need CPG sites to methylate and regulate genomes and everything like that, at least in many organisms. And a dark side, I call it the dark side to methylation, is that whenever you methylate a cytosine, you increase its mutation rate by about 50-fold. So you have this massively high mutation rate at cytosine sites. And they convert to ultimately to thymine by deamination. They go through uracil, I think, and then they go to thymine. And so you lose these CPG sites very rapidly. But they're counteracted by bias gene conversion. So when you have a, if you have two chromosomes and at one site you have a GC or a G or a C and another one you have an A or a T and you get recombination for any reason, either DNA repair or replication, uh, you end up getting the AT sites converted to GC sites. Not 100% of the time, but you have a bias to do that. So the CPG sites in organisms, these sites that methylation acts on, they're really tied into these high recombination areas because they rapidly lose DNA uh, rap not DNA, they rapidly lose the cytosines, but then you have, if it's high recombination, you convert them back in theory, right? And if falcons have lost all these chromosomes, there's a potential for major changes in all these uh, organisms, in, in ATGC content, CPG, and the like. So when we got here, we needed better falcon reference genomes. I thought this was an interesting question to assess uh, in, in this context. So we sequenced eight falcons, uh, four of them are in a subgenus called Hyrofalco, another three are subspecies of peregrines, basically, uh, which are kind of the sister group to the Hyrofalco, and then the common kestrel is an outgroup to all of these, and we sequenced them, uh, they're relatively good metrics, I won't talk too much about them, and they weren't quite chromosome scale, they're about chromosome arm scale, so what we did is we took, we, what we did is we took Mummer, uh, which is an alignment program, and we aligned two reference scale genomes from the Vertebrate Genome Project that just came out, and we could use that to determine what segments of the genome were conserved or currently on microchromosomes or macrochromosomes or the like. And then we could look at relatives of falcons, which are not close relatives, but these are the groups next to them, and see whether those segments were ancestrally on macrochromosomes or microchromosomes or the like. So our first hypothesis uh, kind of looking at this is does the base composition, does the isochoric structure of these genomes uh, correspond to other birds? How much change has been there? So we looked at that, and what we're seeing here is you can break a genome into segments, and you can break it up into what we call isochore families. So these are segments that are either high AT, high GC, or variable somewhere in between. And what we're seeing, so this is kind of GC, AT content across genomes, and what we're seeing is in the lanner falcon on the top left there, we're using that representative because all the falcons pretty much look the same, and they actually all look pretty much the same as all the birds, and the closest thing they look to actually is, is humans, mammals. One explanation for high GC content is temperature tolerance. That's by no means proven, but it's the reason they think maybe mammals and birds have similar ATGC content, whereas the other reptiles have much lower GC content, and birds are slightly higher and falcons do slightly higher GC content than mammals uh, for whatever reason we can discuss later. So our next question is, 
are these genomes in ATGC equilibrium? So at the time we did this, mammals, several mammals are reported to be out of ATGC, ATGC equilibrium. So they're rapidly losing GC content, not rapid, mammals have been losing GC, GC content for a long time, but they are losing GC content, whereas chickens don't really seem to be. Uh, so falcons have lost chromosomes like mammals' ancestors is, are they now out of ATGC equilibrium? So what we could do is we could take all the unique SNPs and use, and use parsimony to determine whether or, not, uh, whether or not these unique SNPs are derived or ancestral, and we could actually figure out the direction of these mutations. So what we could do is uh, look at the relevant ones of this. We see a much higher rate, well, level of transitions to conversions as we expect, but we also see that falcons are out of ATGs out of ATGC equilibrium. So what we see on the graph on the right, your right, is the odds ratio of a GC site going to an AT site. And we looked at this with CPG sites, we looked at this without CPG sites, and we looked at it was fixed and with it's heterozygous. And what we see, I think it's actually cool, if we look at the highest rate, we see it's the heterozygous at CPG sites, right? And that's that CPG hypermutability that we're getting, right? You have a lot of mutations at CPG sites, so you have a lot of, heter a lot of heter heterozygosity at these. But if you look at which one's actually fixed, the blue squares, it's much lower, and that's the bias gene conversion counteracting that loss. And then, if you remove CPG sites, the whole all of it's brought down quite a bit uh, because you don't have the CPG hypermutability. Hyper but the finding is that in all the falcons <laughs> and CPG sites, no CPG sites, they're not in equilibrium. You're losing GC content and going to AT content. And then we can look at that in the past by looking at the annotated segments of the chromosomes that we have uh, and sort of where they are in the proportion to GC and CPG. And what we see is that so the way the notation is here, on the left you have the ancestral state, and then, the, yeah, on the left you have the ancestral state, and on the right you have the current state. So conserved on microchromosome has the largest uh, amount of GC content, as we expect, and the large chromosomes have much lower GC content. And if we look at the microchromosome fused to large chromosomes, we actually have an intermediate level of GC content. So there's been a loss of GC content associated with fusions of these microchromosomes onto macrochromosomes. And likewise, when we look at CPG sites, the trend isn't as clear, it's a lot more variable. Uh, CPG sites are probably under heavy selection, but we still see the same trend in which we see an intermediate level on the micro large. Um, so again, there's been a depletion of GC and a depletion of CPG in falcons. And we can also look at substitutional biases and whether these substitutional biases, we know genome-wide they're out of equilibrium, but are there segments that relate to uh, particular segments of chromosomes? And this kind of tells us whether this process is ongoing, it's in the past and the like. Or, and what we're seeing is there are differences, but for the, there's a strong trend, but, uh, but it's not that significant. But between the micro large uh, intermediate chromosomes and the microchromosomes and large chromosomes, and the fusions again leading to intermediate states, although it's not necessarily significant in all cases. Okay, so falcons have a lot of other really weird things with their genomes, though. So it's been reported that they have the highest amount of insertions compared to any other birds that we can find, uh, and there's a few other things there. So we wanted to see if all of these changes to genomic architecture were influencing other aspects of the genome that people have reported are really, really weird in falcons, like longer intergenic distances, insertion biases, and the like. So we were able to annotate structural variants because we used 10x genomics, let us phase everything so we could even phase structural variants and figure about heterozygous, homozygous, and everything that's there. And the result is we see it, whether it's a large structural variant or an indo, we see a bias toward insertions in falcons uh, overall. You, you get accumulating more insertions, the genome is getting larger. Uh, and if we look at this in the context of ancestral and current chromosome state, what we actually see though is that these insertion biases are strongly concentrated on regions that were former microchromosomes. 
And the explanation for this is we hear about GC bias conversion, but there have been a few reports of insertion bias conversion too in Drosophila. So we think what's happening is you have a higher recombination rate at anything that used to be on a microchromosome, and it's giving you a bias toward insertions. And so Falcon's the long, one of the longest intragenic distances in insertion biases. This again seems to actually relate to chromosome loss, fusions, everything got larger, recombination rate dropped, and now you're accumulating a larger genome. But what about repetitive elements? So in humans, half the DNA is this parasitic DNA. It's DNA that parasitizes and replicates itself throughout the genome. And one of the reasons for recombination is getting rid of repetitive elements. So we kind of wanted to see repetitive elements, what's going on with these. And we actually see a strong depletion in repetitive elements right back in falcons. So what we did here is we annotated repetitive elements and on the further left is more recent, and the further back, it's further right. I mean, further back is in the past, because it's divergence of the repetitive element from a consensus sequence. And as they decay, and it's not under selection anymore, they diverge from the consensus, and it's further in the past. And we did it on all the falcons that were showing the lanner again representative, and then we did the same library of repetitive elements on all the relatives of falcons. And what we see is almost all the repetitive elements, uh, which is on the y-axis there, almost all of those, are present in all the relatives that falcons diverged from tens of millions of years ago. So all the, all, most of the repeats are old. And if we look at, in the corner, the smaller corner ones, if we look at annotations on all of these, all the relatives of falcons using de novo repeats found within these, we see that there's been actually a lot of recent TE activity, a lot of recent transposable element activity, and in falcons we don't. So we can conclude from this that falcons have experienced some sort of release for some reason of transposable elements. They're not subject to the same activity of parasitic DNAs. We also looked at open reading frames with repetitive elements. All we found was a single endogenous retrovirus, which is similar to uh, like an HIV type virus, but we didn't find anything that was actually had an open reading frame and might be reproducing in the falcons. You could look a little further, but the evidence is falcons from multiple lines is that falcons have experienced a loss of transposable element activity, which might have actually freed them to reduce the recombination rate some. But if we look across the different chromosome sizes, we still see an intermediate level of, um, of TE activity uh, on the regions that fused. And we think the reason here is falcons are still deleting some of the TEs, uh, and we've actually seen a reduction in TE clearance still associated with this reduction recombination. Now another really weird thing about falcons is it's been discovered that they actually have a lot of mitochondrial DNA that's been inserted into their genome. So mitochondria have their own DNA. It's not really supposed to insert into the genome, but falcons have much more mitochondrial DNA inserted into the gen genome than other birds. So you're wondering, do chromosomal fusions relate to this at all? What we did is we constructed a mitochondrial tree from all of the major groups of birds, and we withdrew all the, t um, we withdrew all the new mites that we could annotate. New mites are these mitochondrial segments that we could annotate in these genomes. We made a tree of all of them, we clustered them, made several trees, and then mapped all of those onto a large tree. And in blue, you see the number of mitochondrial insertions. On the graph, you see the size, and you see where we estimate these inserted based on how they group with these other mitogenomes um, on the phylogeny on the left. And the red numbers indicate the time that that divergence took place. Uh, it's a time-scaled tree. And so what we see is that falcons do, in fact, have a lot of mitochondrial insertions, and they have huge mitochondrial insertions. So they have mitochondrial DNA insertions that are more than 90% of the mitogenome, the whole, almost the whole mitogenome just stuck into a, a falcon genome. But we could look back and use this method to see if they were inserted onto microchromosomes or macrochromosomes now, or ancestrally onto something that would have been a microchromosome or macrochromosome. And we have not found ancestrally or in the current falcons any insertions onto microchromosomes. These, these mitochondrial DNA segments like to insert onto large chromosomes. Uh, and that could be because of selection or whatever, or re recombination gets rid of them when they insert. And the other finding we had is that after they insert, they seem to decrease in size pretty readily, uh, at least in non-falcons that have normal chromosomal configurations. So, I mean, the conclusion from this segment is that almost all aspects of the falcon genome have in some way been influenced by these chromosomal losses. Uh, and we see that can explain most of the weird things people said, like the bias toward insertions and the like. Lack of TEs is a hypothesis that's hard to test, but it could explain how they were able to get away with the reduction in, combina in recombination. 
Uh, and but nonetheless, we see many aspects of Falcon genomes influenced by these changes in genomic architecture. And if you want to read more about that, you can do that in our recent publication on this. And if you want to explore this or any of the other questions that I talked about earlier relating to Falcons, we've also made 16 phased assemblies available on NCBI that people can use. Uh, so, uh, and I think, like I said, I think Falcons are fantastic models for studying a lot of these things. But there's some other questions too, like what about the actual pop genomics? What's happening at the population scale? Because with reference genomes, we can look at sort of how they're configured, what's there, what's present, um, but, but what's actually happening um, more broadly? And to do that, we sequenced several falcons with 10x genomics at fairly high coverage and aligned all of them to a lanner falcon and looked at some of the population genomics. As you can see, the lanner falcon is kind of an outgroup to both of them, but not all of them. Uh, it's just in hierofalco. Uh, it's about 304,000 years, we estimate, from uh, the other hierofalco, and about 600,000 years from a peregrine falcon. Um, like I said, these are all very recently diverged species, uh, with, but they do have different demographic trajectories in the top there. And there's been a lot of debate ongoing about whether falcons are interbreeding with each other or not, uh, whether there's admixture hybridization. Our admixture plot uh, shows no evidence that falcons are interbreeding with each other. Uh, we are running more sophisticated analyses now to conclusively see if we can say that, but there's really very little evidence that these falcons are inbreeding, at least on a large scale. It's, it's certainly not like common, uh, even if they're very closely related. If you look at unique SNPs and variants, and the polymorphic are in bold in the top, and the fixed are not in bold, we see there's not a lot of fixed differences between the Saker and Shear Falcon, uh, but they don't interbreed. Uh, and as you'd expect, you see a lot of differences between the Peregrine, which is much for older than the rest of them. But now looking at some of the population genetic indicators and chromosome structure to bring it back around, do we see a reduction in recombination rate? Because really our explanation for everything before was that if fusions happen, they lowered recombination, but that's not shown. We don't know that falcons have actually had a reduction in recombination rate. So we can ask first, do the, in falcons, do the macrochromosomes, intermediate chromosomes, and microsomosomes actually have differences in recombination rate? Um, look at the histograms, they do. Uh, these are kind of merged composite for different falcons uh, for statistical reasons, but if we look at the median recombination rate, it's three, depending on the falcon species, it's three to eight, um, ten, three to eight billionths per base pair chance of a recombination event, which is on par with other birds, but actually a little higher, but that might be problems with the me methods or a lack of precision, I guess I should say. But if we look at the fusions, we do see that the fused regions have a reduced recombination relative to microchromosomes for sure, but what's surprising is they actually still have an increased recombination rate relative to large chromosomes, which we can't totally explain. There's no PRDM9 or anything like that in a bird, but there are hotspots, and it seems that some of the hotspots are in fact retained after recombination. Now we can look at nucleotide diversity, and this is gonna ultimately be a metric of mutation rates. And what we see as what we'd expect with the loss of GC content and the like is we see, I remove CPG sites from all of this, but it doesn't really matter that much is that we see that microchromosomes do seem to have higher diversity, probably higher mutation rate than the larger chromosomes. And again, though, the microchromosomes fused to large chromosomes show an intermediate level of diversity, suggesting that they retain an elevated mutation rate after fusion. But finally, we can look at species difference differentiation following fusion. And what we're doing here is I'm just taking the weighted FST between different regions of the genome and seeing how different are they between these species. Because remember, they very recently diverged. And surprisingly, if you looked at it for just the Jiren Saker, which are just a few tens of thousands of years, you would see the opposite trend, same as nucleotide diversity within species. But when you look at it, uh, when you look at it across all the species with much older time frame, we actually see a pretty consistent trend uh, in which the larger chromosomes have greater differentiation than the smaller chromosomes. The fused regions are showing the same thing. And that means that actually these fusions are increasing lineage sorting between species. So you actually get greater genetic differentiation more quickly because of these fusions in the falcon genomes. Uh, so, so that's very tempting. We ask ourselves then, okay, could this be explaining 
selection? Do we see selection acting on these fused regions? Is that a way you can get so much diversity in these falcons so quickly or something like that? So I don't show it because I've shown you enough histograms already. If we look at Tajima's D, we do actually see that fused, fused regions have a reduced Tajima's D. It's hard to say exactly what that means. Uh, but we did scans for selection then to look at are we seeing scans for selection in these. And unfortunately, we don't see anything significant. So this is a big non-significant result. But on the numerator, we have like the larger ones. And, and I guess I'll just summarize this to say, we do see that fused regions have, they're enriched, but not significantly enriched for scan signs of selective sweeps between species. So it's hard to know what that means, and we're looking at it from a more, um, with more precise methods that are running now. But uh, again, it's not totally clear. But we remove CPG sites from this analysis, and that could be important. And then finally, just to give you a little bit of genomics, um, we did also run scans for balancing selection that did produce very strong and clear results that I won't be talking too much about, but as a teaser. So we actually find that actin-1 uh, is under balancing selection in all the falcons. We find that ARC, which is a gene in neuron spaces and that also interacts with actin, is under balancing selection. Mitoferrin, which is an iron metabolism gene, is under balancing selection. and we have an endonuclease we found that was under balancing selection. So these are extremely diverse regions. And actually, if you look at our FST plot, you would see they were extreme outliers. They actually showed up on that because there's no differentiation between species and you retain that diversity. Where is balancing selection occurring? It's universally on large chromosomes, but as most of the genome is on large chromosomes, that's not particularly surprising. Uh, but we're looking more into why these genes might be under balancing selection. But as a final conclusion to the talk, um, fused regions actually retain many features of microchromosomes. Uh, some of this, but not all of this, is explained by a reduction in recombination rate. And we think it'd be worth looking further into uh, that fusions could accelerate the speciation process, because you have these regions in which you have a heightened mutation rate relative to most of the genome, but you all, they also differentiate more quickly between species on the basis of time. Uh, and then the other big issue that we need transcriptomics we haven't done to look at, but that I think has to be looked at at some point, is you've had massive CPG loss and massive changes in regulatory frameworks and falcons as a result of these chromosomal rearrangements. And I think that's a very difficult question, but in the future, it'd be really cool for someone to look at that and see what the difference is and how, how those regulatory frameworks changed. Um, in the meantime, I have a lot of people to thank for my time here. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some of these people. And a special thanks to Susan and Inez, who organized this conference and made this possible, but also made all the research and everything else done here at the CGSB possible. And then I'd like to thank the broader Falcon community here in Abu Dhabi.